I can tell you, get ready, get ready, get ready. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy. You don't have this back there, by the way. For this charge I give to you, my son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you wore a good warfare. Now listen to that again. Timothy, I'm saying to you, according to the prophecies that have previously been made about you, previously been made over you, that you will, by those prophecies, war a good warfare. And uh, so I want to remind you of uh, some things that have happened right here at Bell's Chapel Assembly of God Church. We just watched this revival, uh, this revival video. There's, we're talking about things that Smith Wigglesworth prophesied over this nation, over the age in which we are entering into right this minute, and all of that. So I want to say these things to you. There was a time when Marla Austin stood on our stage, said there will be a river that will run right down through Highway 64. It was an overflowing flood, and it was full of great debris. It was washing down through 64. She at that time said, I do not know what the debris is or why there's debris in the flow. Not long after that in prayer, the Lord spoke to me and said, I remind you that the debris is the whole purpose of the flow. It's the wash, it is the washed, lost, and the broken that I will be washing in. Not long after that, Yvonne got a, a word of prophecy about a tsunami of souls coming. Not long after that, a second wave of a tattooed army coming in. We saw, if you were here last Sunday night, uh, Sunday night a, a week ago, you saw Brother Schlinker prophesying along with what had happened that morning that souls would come in from the north and the south and the east and the west. And that the Arkansas River Valley would still be called the Arkansas River Valley, but for a whole new reason, because a river of the spirit that's been roaming through. In 1994, Don Norton, many of you know him, I've got this prophecy on the wall behind my desk, uh, stuck to the wall. Said, rake back the dirt from your foundations, prepare to build again. I'm going to bring a move of the spirit to this place that's going to cause those who spoke negatively about it in the, in the past to hang their head in shame. My mother prophesied not terribly long ago that the Lord had revealed to her that it was time for the harvest to begin right now. In January, the Lord gave me a thousand souls for 2018. A man many of y'all who do not do not even know because he's been dead and gone from here so long, named Hal Kirkendall, but some of you do remember, had a dream one night that there was he, he came in telling us about it. We did not even own the pasture, and we were in a building that's about a third this size at the time. And he came in, and you just have to know how, in his cut-off uh, blue jean shorts with his oxygen in a paint bucket around his nose. And y'all remember him doing that. He came in and he said, God showed me a dream last night and I saw the whole field completely parked full of cars because so many people were trying to get inside this building because of the move of God. I'll remind you that Smith Wigglesworth prophesied that there would be a river flowing through the Arkansas River Valley. Corey Ten Boom said that as flying, she was flying in an airplane over the United States, looked out the window, asked the pilot, where are we? He said, we're over northwest Arkansas. She says, I see angels with their wings overspread. Wow. Northwest Arkansas, a great revival will strike that land. Wow. Dutch Sheets just recently in 2013 proclaimed that the Lord gave him a prophecy that as goes Arkansas, so will go the revival over the nations. I give you all of these things because Timothy said to us, Stir up the prophecies that have been spoken of you and war a good warfare by these prophecies. So I want to tell you, Bell's Chapel, we have all of these personal prophecies and these prophecies over northwest Arkansas. Prepare yourself to war in the intercessory prayer and grab a hold of this. Do warfare based on these prophecies. Say this, if there's got to be revival in Arkansas, it might as well be here. If there's going to be revival in northwest Arkansas, it might as well be right here. If a river's going to run through it, then it might as well be right here. If God's looking for a people that are willing and he's looking for a people that are hungry, let us get our heart in line with the willing hunger for a thousand souls in 2018. Let us fight a good warfare according to the prophecies that have been given to us. So just wrap your heart around it. I really was kind of hoping to, 
to uh, hit you with a little 220 right there as we're getting started tonight. If you land there on the gurney, kind of like Frankenstein, and your head's working but your heart's not, I was hoping to strike you with a little spiritual lightning tonight to get your heart beating in unison with what God's doing in this house. Tonight is a good night as any to declare revival for Bell's Chapel Assembly of God Church, a thousand souls in 2018. Let's just get ready, get ready, get ready. We'll be hearing more about that as we go along. Answering the question, if I'm supposed to wage a great warfare according to those prophecies, how do I do that? And I've started working on a plan, so uh, just stay tuned. That's all I can tell you on that. Um, I want to make a little bit, yeah, well, okay, I want to do just a little uh, jiggity jig tonight since I'm speaking on legacy and none of y'all have any idea what I'm even talking about with that anyway, since I'm just making this up as I go, then I can just make it be whatever I want, right? So legacy, now we're going to talk about faith for a second. Legacy in faith, just for a second. Y'all all know the scripture says, walk by faith and not by sight, right? right? Walk by faith and not by sight. Now, the scripture says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now, I'm using a little algebra on you. Because the word is, if you change, if you convert English to algebra, the word is is always an equal sign, and the word of is always multiplication. So this says faith is the substance of things hoped for. And faith is the evidence of things not seen. I'm going to take you just on a little bit of a ride, so y'all might have to hang on, because I'm Speedy Gonzalez in all this tonight. Now listen to me. God calls those things that be not as though they are. Everybody stay with me. Does everybody understand that Hebrews, the scripture says, God calls those things that be not as though they are. Right? So everybody say that with me. God calls those things that be not as though they are. So we hear that quoted all the time. He's talking about Abraham right there in that scripture. He called Abraham the father of many nations before Abraham even had a child. Because God calls those things that be not as though they are. Now we forget that the verse, if you read that whole verse, there's a statement previous to that that means the exact same thing. It says, God quickeneth the dead. Okay? That's the exact same thing. I will show you it's the exact same thing as that God calls those things that be not as though they are. I am taking you somewhere. I'm not just on a crazy meander, okay? Now, listen to this. God calls those things that be not as though they are. God quickeneth the dead. In other words, God calls those things that be not as though they are in this fashion. Since God knows the beginning from the end, true or false? Does God know the beginning and the end? Yes, otherwise when he said Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth, we'd have to say, how does that happen? Because he knew from the moment of creation that there would be a time that Jesus would come and die on the cross. Because he knows the end from the beginning. So, since God knows the beginning and the end, when God makes a prophetic statement of fact, so stay with me right here, every time God makes a, a comment of, prof of prophecy, it is not a possibility. It is a factual statement of completion. When God says that there is a rapture that is to come, when God says there will be a second coming, when God says there will be an antichrist, when God says all of that stuff that we would call prophetic, anytime God speaks prophetically, meaning of a future event, it actually God speaks out of a fact that's in his mind. God knows it already is fact. As a matter of fact, he's just reporting what he has already seen in its entirety of truth, even though you've not seen it yet. That's good. That's good. When God says, you'll lay hands on the sick and they recover. That's a prophetic statement. Why did he say that? 
He said that because he looked across time and he saw the day and age that after Jesus would resurrect that men would be filled with the power of the Holy Ghost and that you would lay hands on the sick and people would recover. He reported it in the book of Isaiah, not as a possibility, not as a might happen, not as it could be, but in Isaiah, God opened his mouth and reported a statement of fact because he had already seen it happen 2,000 years from now. When God opens his mouth to speak prophecy, he's speaking statements of fact. Not possibilities, not could be's. He's speaking statements of fact. He's just reporting what he sees and knows to be true, even though you have not seen it yet. Right? So how is it that God quickens the dead? In other words, the dead is unseen, Unknown, unrealized, and unfulfilled. Too many L's. The, the dead is unseen, unknown, unrealized, and unfulfilled. God quickened the dead. How does God quicken the dead? I want to show you exactly how God quickens the dead. God quickens the dead because His Word will not return void. God speaks a word of prophecy. He's not talking about possibilities, could be's, or might be's. He's speaking a statement of fact. He's already seen it happen. He knows the end from the beginning. He looks across the eons of time and then comes back to your state of being and says to David a word of prophecy. He's speaking a statement of fact from what he knows is already done. And we get 99.999% of that out of the book. You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It's a word of prophecy in Isaiah 58. Why did he say it? He said it because he'd already seen it take place, knew it was coming, reported it as a statement of act in, Acts in Isaiah 58, and then it had to happen because he called that which was not yet seen and not yet fulfilled. When God wrapped his word around it, his word never returns void, and it set the unseen into motion. So when God speaks, he speaks to you of the unseen seen. When God opens his mouth and speaks, when you find something in this book that's not yet fulfilled, God is speaking the unseen seen. What do you mean? You hadn't seen it yet, but he already has. You haven't seen it yet. But he already has. God says to you, fear not, for I am with you. My rod and my staff, they cover you. It's a statement of fact, a prophetic statement of fact over you, over your life, over your situation. And you say, I haven't seen it yet. But God says, I'm already there. I've already seen it. I've already seen the end from the beginning. I know what your situation is. I know what you're going through. I know what's happening. I know what the reports are. But I don't care. I've seen the end from the beginning. And I speak life over you, the unseen seen. And just by opening his mouth and speaking it into existence, it quickens the dead and brings it to pass. It's the unseen saint. Now, let me go back up there, back up here, and show you this. The word substance right there actually can be word called assurance. And hope for is expectancy. If you go back to the original definitions, your faith is an assured expectancy. You say, now what's an assured expectancy? You know what the difference between an assured expectancy is and a possible expectancy? Let's say David's going across town. He says, hey, when I, when I get across town, I'll bring you a burger back to the church. Now I have a possible expectancy. David's a pretty good guy. David tries to always follow his word. But I don't know. He might have a flat. He might get diverted. Something might happen. And he might show up. I have a possible expectancy. But is it an assured expectancy? No. No. 
I have a possible expectancy. Anytime any man says anything to me, it's a possible expectancy. And because we deal with men at the level of possible expectancy and often are let down by them, we begin to project onto Abba the effects and works of other fathers and men who operate in possible expectancies. But God does not operate in possible expectancies. God operates in assured expectancies. And my faith is when his unseen seen becomes an assured expectancy in my life and I begin to now operate, walk, talk, act, think, and move on the unseen scene of God, not the seen, unseen of my own heart. What do you mean the seen, unseen? The seen unseen looks like this. I walk by sight and not by faith. I know what I see. I know what I'm experiencing. I know what reality is in my life. I see the things I can touch. I see the things I can hear with my ears. I see the things that are going on around my life. And it's unseen yet whether God's going to do anything. And we want to operate in the seen unseen. While God is operating in the unseen seen. And the day I will give up. My seen, unseen attitude and grab a hold of faith as an assurance of expectancy. In other words, when I open this book and I find a promise of God in it, or I get a word from God dropped into my heart, that I receive it as an assured expectancy. I don't waver. I don't wiggle. I don't think maybe. I say this is an assured expectancy for my life. And I now start walking like it, talking like it, thinking like it, prepping for it, acting like it, because it is now an unseen scene within me. Because I know that God has spoke to me a statement of fact, not possibility. Sarah received faith. Fair, sir, excuse me. Sarah judged him faithful who had promised and received the strength to have seed within her to bear a child. How did that happen? Because God said to her, your husband will be the father of many nations and you will bear a son. And from that moment, she no longer said, I see myself as barren and I have a son that is unseen. But she said this, though our son is yet unseen, yet down deep inside me, I have seen seen him. I have held him. I have rocked him. My heart is embracing an assured expectancy of a son that will lay in my lap and I will no longer walk, talk, think, act, or respond like a barren woman. But now I walk, talk, think, act, and respond like a mother would do. Why? Because she had an assured expectancy, which is faith. Faith is an assured expectancy. It is proof. Things not seen. It is proof of the unseen. What is the unseen? The quickened dead. The unseen is the quickened dead. What is it in your life that is dead but God has already quickened? Think about it. What is it in your life that you would say it is dead? Now, listen to this statement. God will not react to you in your current state. He's reacting to you as you will be. No. Say that again. God is not reacting to you as you are in your current state. God reacts to you as you will be. He said to Abram, I call you the father of many nations, and now I will call you Abraham. He never again called him Abram. From that day forward, he called him Abraham, and there was not a son in his arms. God no longer reacted to Abraham. From that day forward, he had reacted to Abraham according to what God knew the facts were, not according to what Abraham could see. Let me say this again. God is not reacting to you in your current state. He is reacting to you as he knows you will be. Now, let me throw this out there. We often say within ourselves, 
God calls those things that be not as though they are. But we really want God sometimes to call those things that are as though they be not. Think about that. I'll say that again because that's a little bit of a tongue tie. God calls those things that be not, quickening the dead, God calls those things that be not as though they are. He calls the dead to life. But we oftentimes want God to call those things that be as though they be not. That is contrary to the nature of God. Let me say that again. It is contrary to the nature of God to call those things that be not, excuse me, those things that be as though they be not. I'm going to give you a prime example. Oh, we got, I've heard a man say one time, if you don't understand the first five chapters of the book of Genesis, you're in trouble. Read the first five chapters of the book of Genesis till you get understanding. And I'm going to take you all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. God said, let there be light. Now watch. God did not say, let there be no darkness. As a matter of fact, God did not label the darkness, did not respond to the darkness, did not curse the darkness, nor did he ever even act like darkness had ever existed. We want God to look in our life and see darkness and call those things that are as if they are not. We want him to respond to the darkness. We want him to notice the darkness. We want him to react to the darkness. But God does not do it that way. God calls those things that be not as though they are. He looked out over darkness and completely did not even mention darkness nor respond to darkness because he had already seen light and he responded to that which was not as though it was. He said, let there be light. There was no light. Then there was light. Why? Because he completely disregarded the darkness. They spoke to what was not, and it was. Right. Right. So, stop worrying about God not calling those things that are in your life as though they are not. We have issue, we have sickness, we have disease, and we want God to look at our disease and make something of our disease and be concerned about our disease and respond to our disease and talk to that disease and curse that disease. But remember this, the scripture says, even the angels did not bring railing accusations against Satan when they were arguing with him over the body of Moses. They didn't even respond to them. They just took his body. Why? Because that you, God does, it's contrary to his nature to respond to you in your current condition. He will respond to you on what he has already seen and knows as fact about your life. I really don't care if God looks at me if I have disease and talks to my disease. As long as he looks at me and says where there was darkness, completely ignore it, Lord. Just call me the light. Don't respond to the darkness. Don't move in the darkness. Don't curse the darkness. Why waste any time with the darkness? You've already seen eons of ages beyond the darkness. You've seen 10 million sunrises and sunsets already. Just call the sun. And don't respond to the darkness at all. Don't even act like the darkness exists. Just look right over it. And call those things that be not as though they are in your life. Quickening the dead. Because he's already looked. And where you see death, he sees life. Where you see lack, he sees plenty. Where you see hopelessness, he sees hope. Where you see darkness, he sees light. On and on we can go with that. Because he doesn't see it as unseen, unknown, unrealized, or unfulfilled. But he is a God of prophecy. That is a statement of fact. Because he already has seen the end from the beginning. He knows your completed end. He knows your expected end. He knows your desire. He knows where you're going. He knows what his desire is for you. And he is crying it out over you. Quickening the dead. So let me say it again. God is not reacting to you in your current state. God is reacting to you as you know, as he knows you will be. I'll ask you a favor. Please stop laying in the wallow of what you are fighting. 
and screaming at God. Notice I'm in the mud. Notice there's hogs trampling me. Notice I'm caught in this pig pen. Notice my despair. Notice this thing that's upon me. Would you please do something about the stench? Would you do something about the mud? Would you do something about the pigs? Would you do something about my current state? When he's looking at you and saying, my son, you king and priest. Calling you out of the mud, not by noticing the mud and making something out of the mud, but by noticing your royalty, by noticing your divinity, by noticing your salvation and calling you up out of that mud, calling those things that be not as though they are, calling that unseen, unknown, unrealized, unfulfilled thing, bringing it to light because he spoke a word of life over you. God is the God of the unseen seen. Have you ever just thought to stop long enough and say, God, what do you see for me and in me? What is the unseen scene that is to come? What are you quickening in my life? Faith is assured expectancy. What's it going to cost you to stop having possible expectancy and start embracing assured expectancy? What's that cost? Think about it. You see, we all like to hedge our bets because we've learned how to eat disappointment. Mama promised us that she'd bring us home candy from the grocery store. And she gets busy and forgets. And she comes back and there's no candy in the bag. Daddy promises us that next Saturday we'll all go swimming. And he gets called in for work and he doesn't get to go. And you expected it all week. And Saturday morning the phone rings. And you see him in there putting on his work clothes. And you're greatly disappointed. We've learned how to eat disappointment. So we've learned how to hedge our hearts. To a place of possible expectancy. And not grab a hold of assured expectancy. And listen to me. When we're dealing with Abba. It's a lie from the devil. And it will withhold us from a move of the spirit. What's it going to cost you. To completely sell out. Not a possible thousand souls for 2018 but what's it going to cost you to completely sell out your whole heart mind soul and strength to the fact that god looked at december 31 saw a thousand souls brought into the kingdom spoke it as a statement of fact over us as an assured expectancy what does it cost you Because you see, then we get to go back over to the next part of that. How do I walk by faith and not by sight? Because once I become, ask yourself this. How did Sarah act after those words? What was Abraham's life like after those words? Was there a period of no child? Yes. Were there days when they went on and on and on and there was still no child? Absolutely. But the Bible says Sarah judged him faithful. Day in, day out. Morning, noon, and night. She judged her king faithful. She had an assured expectancy. An assured expectancy. So embrace that. An assured expectancy for yourself tonight. Embrace that. How does that, die? how does that go along with legacy? Here's how this goes along with legacy. Remember in legacy, I keep saying this. Learn to walk, talk, think, act, react, just like Jesus. Yeah, yeah, like that ain't hard. <laughs> That's why I'm preaching on it, Jared. Trying to get us to learn that. Walk, talk, think, act, react just like Jesus. You see, because that's assured expectancy. Walk in your assured expectancy. Talk like you have assured expectancy. Think like you have assured expectancy. Act like you have assured expectancy. React like you have assured expectancy. Assured expectancy. 
Not possible expectancy, assured expectancy. Walk, talk, think, act like you have assured expectancy. Now you begin to understand what the scripture means when it says walk by faith and not by sight. Walk by the unseen seen, not by the seen unseen. Walk by faith, the unseen seen. Not by sight, the seen yet unseen. See how that ties together? Walk by faith and not by sight. Yep. If I'm going to be walking by faith and not by sight, and I'm walking along and I'm just doing pretty good, and then I stumble, mm -hmm. and then I'm talking pretty good, <coughs> and then for a little bit I start being negative. Mm -hmm. So what I need to do then is once I realize that I've stumbled, or once I realize that I'm negative, or once I realize that I've let that used to be the way I think mm -hmm. or I acted like I used to act. Once I did that, I don't need to stop and look at the scene, but I need to continue to look at the unseen. Unseen. Yes, I need to come to the place that the unseen scene is as real to me as the seen unseen. So that means I don't stop and focus on that's right. I just keep my eyes forward and know that God's already helped this work out if I just keep pushing towards Him. Exactly. Yes, that is exactly right. So if you catch yourself in the middle of something, you know, I've done that a few times this week, but on the temper wire, I've got to I have actually done that today, as a matter of fact. You catch yourself and you just kind of, I go off my face just to just keep on rolling. Mm -hmm. Just keep on going. Yes, just keep on going. Repent and go on. Repent and go on. It's a learning process. Anybody in this room perfect yet? No. no. Not a. No. Bruce? Say that again. He doesn't look at me in my work state. He doesn't look at me. Let, me. let me read it like I said it. He is not reacting to you in your current state. He is reacting to you as he knows you will be. God is not reacting to you in your current state. He reacts to you as he knows you will be. The example of that is this. When God saw the darkness, he did not react to the darkness. He spoke to the light. When God looked at Abraham, he no longer called him Abram. He called him Abraham. From the moment the prophecy went forward, he never called him Abram again. He was always Abraham from that point forward. Is God just, is he disappointed? Or how does God feel about his children that are I think he has desire for us all to reach the expected end. And for if we go below his greatest desire, you know, for me to say God's disappointed in you, I'm not going to say that. He, he's exceedingly in love with all of us. We've accepted him as our Savior. We're forgiven of our sins. Our names in the Lamb books of life, and we're going to heaven. But he has an expected end for us that's far greater than we're in. I don't care if you turn into Billy Graham tomorrow. There's a greater end than that. That's only even just a portion of what he really wants for us. It's kind of like us with our children. We have goals and hopes for our children. And we watch them as they go along. The right. way. And sometimes they get off track and we help them get back on track. And sometimes they do what we hope. And all she, all she ain't lying there. I tell you what, I, I, I corrected this little boy right here too much. And he <laughs> fell off of the chair or the seat the other day when Jay was driving the pickup truck. And I, I see myself falling out of that same seat. And the Lord doesn't embrace itself. You know, you yeah. Know, I see that all the time. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to take a, like seven or throw minutes and, uh, <laughs> and, and jump us to another place. So let's, everybody, now I'm, I'm flipping you about two and a half pages over in your, on the scriptures. Romans chapter 8, verse 37. We're going to jump to the middle of the night instead of the beginning of where I was supposed to actually start out. Romans chapter 8, verse 37. You are more than conquerors. Right? Yes. Romans 8.37. You are more than conquerors through how? 
You are more than conquerors through Christ. Everybody under the sound of my voice, you are more than conquerors. Now, let me throw this out there to you. Jesus actually defeated the enemy. Is everybody with me on that? Jesus actually defeated the enemy. Jesus Christ is the captain of your salvation. He is the king of kings. Past tense. He already did it. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 tells me this. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Talking about the seed which was Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the foot on the head of Satan. That is a vic victor's position over a defeated enemy's position. Okay? Keep that in mind. Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 scripture says, And Jesus having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Jesus triumphed over the enemy and made a show of them openly. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. For as much then as children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part in the flesh and blood. Watch this. That through death he might destroy. Catch that word. Through death Christ might destroy him that had the power of death. Who was that? That is the Devil, look at the scripture up there. So in other words, Jesus destroyed the devil, made a show of him openly, and stands with his foot on his head prophetically forever. Amen. Got that? So let me ask you this question. Is the devil defeated? Yes. Is his head crushed? Yes. yes. Is he made a show of openly? Yes. Absolutely. And you are more than a what? I conquer. Listen, Christ is the conqueror. He made a fish, finished work of it. What makes you more than a conqueror? More than a conqueror is an inheritor. A conqueror takes the land by conquest. More than a conqueror means you got your land not by conquest, but you inherited the land. Let me ask you this question. Which is greater, a king of war or a king of peace? A king of peace. If it is a king of war, a king of war comes and gets your sons, takes them to war, kills them, and then don't bring them home. A king of war takes your food, takes your animals, takes your homes. But a king of peace brings peace. He allows you to keep your sons and your crops and your animals and live on your own land. So a king of peace is greater than a king of conquest. You are called kings and priests. And as a matter of fact, you have been called kings of peace to the land you have inherited. More than a conqueror. Now, there will be in your land pockets of resistance. I'm going to give you proof of all this. Those pockets of resistance will include skirmishes as invaders try to come into your land and places of rebellion that must be stopped, but still an overall land of peace. Even when David had joined Judah and Israel and the land was enjoying peace, he still had to occasionally have, he would have bands of marauders that would come into the land. He would have to send an army to brought them off. But it was still, the land was in peace. And he would have small pockets of rebellion that might pop up, but he would send men, squelch it, but still the land was in peace. Listen to me. You are a king and priest unto God, kings through the blood of Jesus Christ, and you have been given a land as more than a conqueror and a son who inherited. Your land is to be in peace. But you are going to have pockets of rebellion and skirmishes coming against your land occasionally. Now, unless somebody wants to tell me their life is perfect and they've never had any trouble. No, oh, so I think we could all agree you're going to have skirmishes and you're going to have pockets of resistance here and there. Now listen, as a king of a land of peace, this is very, very important what I'm about to say. As the king of a land of peace, your greatest battle will not be against the devil. Very important. Your greatest battle will be against you. Too many saints 
want to talk about how much they fight the devil, 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 fight the devil. And he is out there, and he does cause skirmishes, and he does raise up a rebellion. But Christ has already given you every weapon necessary to bring down every stronghold. He's given you every sword, every shield, everything you need. You already have the armor of God. You have every single thing necessary at your disposal to keep your land in peace, the greatest battle will not be against Satan. He's already defeated. It's going to be against you. Here's why. I must keep me as a holy place controlling myself in the legacy of Christ regarding what comes into my life. Walk, talk, think, act, react like Jesus. Walk, talk, think, act, react like Jesus. Ask yourself this question. How did Jesus withstand the fury of his temptation? How did Christ withstand the fury of the passion? The whipping, the nails, the piercing, the pulling of the beard, the spitting, the cursing, the trial, all of that. How did Jesus withstand it? And this is the answer. He did it without a word. Why did he do it without a word? Now watch. Because as a king, here's our example. He was king of kings. And as a king, under every attack, under every stroke, under, under every blow, he maintained his self-control as a king. He, react, he responded like a king should respond. He did not scream. He didn't beg for mercy. He didn't fall down on his knees to worship another. He took every blow, every spit, every curse, every slap, and he took it in the self-control of a king fit for a throne. When the enemy comes against you in your life and it's blow after blow and curse and spit and strike and blood, what is your example? You stand under self-control with your mouth shut and don't you fall on your face before your enemy and beg for mercy from your enemy. The day you give land for peace, you lost already. Amen. To advocate land for peace just means you have less land to stand on when the real war comes. So when the enemy, when it's a blistering attack and we're not sure what to do and we feel like we're under blow under blow and the blood is running, you don't move. Control your mouth like a king. It's your land. It belongs to you. You are not alone. It's a land of peace. Don't you move. Don't you shake. Don't you fall on your face before your enemy. Don't you move a muscle. Don't yield your land for peace. Don't do it. Let me give you some examples. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 says, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4, For the weapons of your warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We want that to be external, but it is not. I can prove it by going to the next verse. Watch the next verse. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into the captivity of Christ. All three of those things. That place, that high place that wants to exalt itself against the knowledge of God, those thoughts and those imaginations are internal warfare. And he's given you every weapon necessary to bring down every stronghold. What stronghold? The strongholds of my mind and of my flesh. I bring them into captivity. I cast down those thoughts. I cast down those imaginations. I cast down every high thing against Christ. And I say, no, 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 no. I am a king of the king of kings. I stand on a land that I inherited from my king. And you may strap me and you may jerk my beard out, but I will not trade land for peace. Amen. Not one inch of my mind am I trading for peace. Not one inch of my meditation am I trading for peace. I literally have done this multitude of times since I started studying this out. Anybody ever notice that you can imagine and meditate yourself through every bad case scenario that exists if you'll let your mind do it? Amen. Well, I'm going to go to the doctor and he's going to tell me this and I'm going to have to take these treatments and they're going to cut my leg off and then they're going to send me over here. I'm going to end up in the nurse home. Nobody's going to come see me. I mean, you know, between the, in the drive from Actors to Russville, you can have yourself married three times. <laughs> 
What is that? That listen to me. It is the process of your enemy meditating on destruction, exalting high things onto the throne of your heart and in your mind. When that starts up, that is an opportunity for you to bring every thought into the captivity of Christ. You cast out every thought, every imagination, every high thing that would exalt itself against Christ, and you bring your thoughts and your meditations. I've come to the point that once that starts, I say no. In the name of Jesus, I will not meditate on an end separate from the selected end of my king for my life. I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to meditate on it. I'm not going to give it space inside my land. Why? Because I know this. I am the king of a land of peace. And the only way it's going to stay at peace is if I set up borders around it. And when those skirmishes begin to try to come into the land, I hold strong fences. My meditations, especially the words of my mouth, my reactions, I'm going to walk, talk, think, act, and react like Jesus would. If you don't know how Jesus would, I have a good, good news for you. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Do it over and over. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you'll find how Jesus would have walked, talked, thought, and act. Right there. So I keep my land... Just like Jesus would in internal warfare. I'm going to give you this example. As Israel overwhelmed the land of Canaan. Think about this. Joshua was leading them into the land of Canaan. And as they were going, they had battle after battle, war after war. Okay? But now stay with me. They had battle after battle, war after war. But they always won if they stayed true to the legacy they were given. When they walked like God would walk, talked like God would talk, act like God would act, and reacted like God would react, God always fought their battles for them. Listen, the scripture in Luke chapter 11, verse 21 and 22 says, I read this one to you the other day, when a strong man armed keeps his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than the strong man comes upon him and overcome him, he takes all his goods. Let's go back to the first part. When a strong man armed keeps his goods, goods. When I, as the strong man, well armed, keep my goods, I do it. Now watch. They're standing over there and they're marching around Jericho, marching around Jericho, marching around Jericho because they're doing it exactly like God said. What happened to Jericho? Walls fell. They utterly destroyed it. They go to Ai and they're going to go battle against Ai. Ai is a walled city. Very strong. Now the first time somebody committed sin and didn't do what was right. And that 18,000 of them got killed. They go back, get the sin out of the camp, go back and do it exactly like God does. And the army of God enjoined them. They got a supernatural battle plan, drew Ai out of the city. They stole into the city, burned the city, set the city on fire, and killed every last breathing soul in Ai. Go back and read it. City after city after city. Walled cities they would destroy in two days. That for everybody else they would have to set up huge encampments and embankments against it. And they'd have to set up their siege engines and wait them out till they starved to death. And take six months, a year, or two years to overtake these cities they would do it in two days. One time, they're having such a war against the men. There were a bunch of kings came against Gilgal, who they had made a covenant with, and they went to rescue Gilgal, and they, the battle was taking so long, Joshua said, Sun, don't you move. Moon, don't you move. And for the space of a day, the sun and the moon did not move at all until they had utterly destroyed every last breathing soul of those kingdoms, and the sun set back in order. Who does that? I'll tell you who does that. Children of the living king who have inherited a land of milk and honey that is supposed to be a land of peace who will walk, talk, think, act, and react like their king does. You may have war. You may have battles. You may even have to take down some fortified cities. But when you do it where it takes everybody else two years, you're going to do it in two days. You're going to get glorified battle plans straight from the throne room, spoke straight into your heart and know how to go to the weak underbelly of the enemy. And you're going to find victory that the world don't even understand why. Because you're walking, talking, thinking, acting, and reacting like God himself would if he was warring in your land. 
Yes, you're going to have battles, but you're going to be victorious in all of them. Yes, you're going to have to defeat the enemy, but they're going to be so afraid of you, they will turn and run at your side. That's what happened in the land of Canaan, a land of peace. You've been given a land of peace as a king and a priest. Your land. Do not give up land for peace. Walk in the legacy of Jesus Christ. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 through 15. Now I'm going to be done. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 through 15. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay. But as captain of the hosts of the Lord, I am now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the Lord and did worship and said unto him, What sayest my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose your shoes from off your feet, for the place you stand on is holy ground. And Joshua did exactly that. And did you know from that day forward, the, the, the captain of the hosts of the Lord's army prevailed over their enemies time after time. Where do you think Joshua got the battle plans? Where do you think he learned the skill? Because he had the voice of the king's own army in his ears. How many of you would really like to keep your land as a land of peace with the captain of the Lord's army at your side? I got good news for you. I've got better than that. You see, there was a time when the Lord sent the captain of the Lord's army. Now he sends far which is the dunamis creative power of God to dwell inside of you. You now have the heart of God, the mind of God, and the power of God dwelling inside of you. You have ten times greater than the hosts of all the Lord's army, including his captain, dwelling inside of you. And you've been given the word of God as a sword in your mouth. Stop advocating your land for peace. armies of the Lord camped around about me. But guess what? I have the power of the Holy Ghost. I get the captains of the Lord's armies as an added benefit, but I have better than that to start with. Amen. I'll take all of them. I feel like that we're surrounded by them all the time, but we have the power of Jesus himself said, it is expedient for you that I go away. That means even better. You're going to have more, better power because I'm going to send you the comforter, Amen. the Holy Ghost. Stop abdicating your land for peace. And when the battle is so strong that you don't know what to do, and when you've done everything you know to do and the enemy still comes, and you are just absolutely overcome, the scripture says, having done all to stand, I stand. Therefore, having my loins girded about the truth, don't move. Jesus took the straps and the, the sword and the cursing and the spitting and died on that cross. But it only lasted three days. And he resurrected in more power and glory than he ever had in the flesh. If your flesh is going through stuff and you cannot even understand how it's going to happen, don't you move. You stand right there and when you've done all you can do to stand, you stand and do not advocate your land for peace. If you die in that spot, just like Abraham knew of Isaac, if I burn him on that altar, he'll resurrect him up out of the ashes. You stand there and you declare, if I die standing in this spot, you're going to resurrect me up out of it for you promised me I have an expected end and it's my land. Don't give it up. Amen. Don't give it up. I'm going to quit right there. Father, I thank you for your power and your grace. Father, I thank you that your word is a lamp under our feet, a light under our path. And Father, I thank you that it is a sword in our hand, in our mouth, a fire in our belly. Father, tonight, tonight we embrace our legacy. You've given us a land and a possibility of peace in it. And Father, we declare we will walk, talk, think, act, and react as Christ in it, as you give us the power and the strength. As we're going through the rest of these lessons on this, Father, open our eyes to see, ears to hear, and heart to understand. Truly, God, we want legacy. We want legacy in our land that we will bear much fruit, that you will be glorified. In Jesus' name.
Amen. God bless each and every one of you. Thank you for being here tonight. See you here Sunday morning, 945 for Sunday school.